So a very warm welcome to this afternoon's lecture with Dr. Ines Gregori Labata, How to Write Gender Fluid Characters. And we're thrilled to welcome Ines for her first lecture with us. The lecture is part of a programme of humanities lectures that we're currently hosting at University Centre Telford. So my name is Paula Harrison and I'm the host for this afternoon and I'm the coordinator of University Centre Telford. We're part of the University of Wolverhampton and we're based in the heart of Shropshire in Telford. Now I'm actually in the centre today um, as we're reopening tomorrow some classes, which is really exciting after five months of being away. Since we moved our lecture programme online at the start of the pandemic, it's become even more successful and has reached more local, national and international audiences. So before I hand over to Ines, there's just a couple of housekeeping things to go through. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the lecture via the Q&A button. And if you're using a laptop or a desktop, the icon is on the bottom of your screen in the middle. If you're using a mobile, it will be in the top right hand corner. And just to remind you that we're using Zoom, it's a public platform and the lecture is being recorded. So please don't share any personal information. So Inez lectured in creative writing at Lancaster University and the University of Central Lancashire from 2016 to 2020, before moving to the University of Wolverhampton last year in 2020. She's a writer and she's published five books. She has a BA in Modern Languages, Culture and Communication, English and Japanese from the Autonomous University of Madrid. She has an MA in Creative Writing from Lancaster University in 2015 and a PhD in Creative Writing from Lancaster University from 2019. So a very warm welcome to Inez and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Paula. Thank you for thank inviting you. me. <laughs> um, I'm very glad to be here um, for the first time to deliver this lecture on how to write um, gender fluid characters. Um, so this is a creative writing lecture. So I'm hoping that um, since you are here, you have an interest in writing in some way or another. Um, and that's going to be my main focus. But just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about. First of all, to understand the complexity of gender in a literary and critical framework. And then we will be seeing how different authors have approached the writing of gender fluid characters, which may seem something quite new these days uh, or something quite challenging as well. Uh, you may be thinking from the point of view of the author um, and to see what kind of strategies you can incorporate on your writing um, if you wanted to write a character that is gender fluid. So it's a character that is not male or female. Um, so, um, because this is a creative writing lecture, um, I wanted to be a bit creative with the delivery. Um, and I, want, I wanted to ask that you uh, join me doing these very brief tasks throughout the lecture. Um, so they're gonna be very short. So if you can just dedicate, say three minutes to create a random character. So if you have a piece of paper next to you and a pen, or if not, you know, the notes up on your phone or, your, or on your computer and you can very quickly create a random character so just simply whatever thing that comes to mind is fine obviously i'm not going to ask you to share uh, if you don't want to but just you know random person give them a name think where are they from what do they look like if you want to give them some goals in life and then to make it a bit more interesting what are they afraid of so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to, to do this, um, just to have fun and be a bit creative. So I have a timer in here and um, yeah, we'll continue in a little while. Um, all right, um, just to scribble a few ideas down here and I hope you also started creating these characters. So if you put that aside, um, we will return to this at some point in the lecture. Um, 
So first of all, I wanted to give you a sort of background to the idea of gender fluidity. Uh, many of you may think that gender fluidity is something very modern, something that is happening just right now or in a very recent past, but actually the idea of gender fluidity has been with us for a very, very long time. Uh, for example, one of the first disciplines to explore this idea of gender fluidity was in fact alchemy. Um, in alchemy, uh, generally what is known about it is um, kind of like a path and an idea to turn any metal into gold. Uh, but really alchemy, what it is, is all about uh, reaching the maximum wisdom, really. Um, and in alchemy, the transcendence of the binary gender is related to that alignment. So alchemists were not just looking to uh, turn things into gold, but they were also looking for alignment. And part of reaching that alignment was sort of like overcoming this idea of gender, of gender and sort of becoming this uh, sort of female and male androgen that you can see there uh, in the picture. Um, and that kind of symbolized how the soul had reached this maximum level of alignment, this superior wisdom. Um, in fact, another thing, another part where you can find gender fluidity is actually in Christianity, which is maybe quite surprising. Uh, but in fact, early Christianity was way more accommodating to gender fluidity than it may seem today. Um, and we find some examples of this idea of transcending the gender in places like the Gospel of Thomas, where uh, Christ states that alignment will be reached when the male and the female become into a single one. Um, so again, another idea of gender fluidity. Um, and these days, Queer theology, which is a branch of gender studies that sort of studies example of queerness in religious texts, uh, sort of shows how, for example, there are some examples of gender fluidity in places like the Catholic Church, where you have uh, the idea of celibate priesthood that is kind of acts like a kind of like third sex or a kind of intersex. So as you can see, we can find gender fluidity in lots of places um, in the past. But if you are interested in gender fluidity or in the idea of gender and you want to understand it a bit better, one of the main works in this area, one of the most important ones and one you really want to go looking at is the book Gender Trouble by Judith Butler. Judith Butler is a scholar of gender studies and this is her most well-known work that, you know, it was published a few years ago now in 1990, but um, it's still very relevant in this field. So, the reason why gender trouble is so important is because it was the first work that sort of suggested the idea that gender is something that one performs, something that one enacts. So it's not something that you get given at birth, if that makes sense. And because it's something that you can perform, then you can change it or it moves throughout a spectrum rather than being a binary. So I have here a few quotes from gender trouble. Um, so for example, you know, if gender is something that one becomes, then it's a kind of action that can proliferate between the binary limits. And Butler also sort of shows the idea that um, external genitalia uh, is not a sufficient criteria to determine sex and not even genetics. Um, so it's a very interesting book. I have to say it's, um, it's quite a dense reading, so it requires a lot of you, but uh, definitely very important work to look, to look at for gender studies and gender fluidity as well. Um, but moving on from a more critical framework to fiction and storytelling, because as I said at the beginning, I'm gonna be looking at this from the point of view of a writer. So I'm gonna be looking specifically at storytelling examples. One of the first books ever published that had gender fluid characters was this science fiction book uh, called The Left Hand of Darkness, written by Ursula K. Le Guin. Now, Le Guin is a very, very famous science fiction writer, uh, one of the main science fiction writers. Uh, she died very recently in 2019, I believe. Um, and The Left Hand of Darkness was one of, the, one of her first books and the one that sort of was a breakthrough in her career. So it was published in 1969. Um, and the main characters in this book are the inhabitants of this planet uh, in which human beings 
are gender fluid. So basically, uh, they are neither female nor male. Uh, what happens with them is that when they reach maturity, when they become adults, they have this fertile period every month called chimer. Um, and during this fertile period, they would develop either male or female organs. Um, so they can be men or women in that period, uh, but it, this can change through cycles as well. So it's interesting, this book is very interesting because it's one of the first to explore this idea of gender fluidity. Um, and I have here a quote from the book because uh, the, the narrator of the book is someone who comes to this planet to learn about these people, so it's observing them. And it's interesting to note how Le Guin, as the author, how she uses the masculine pronoun to refer to these characters, even though they are gender fluid. Uh, and one of the reasons as of why she does that is uh, because she's using the masculine pronoun he, uh, as you can see in this quote, sees it as a pronoun that can transcend gender, gender that is like, um, as it says, when you refer to God, even you know that God is not necessarily a male or a female entity and so on and so forth. So I'm just drawing attention to this because uh, today this could seem quite an old fashioned strategy to use the male pronoun to refer to gender fluid characters, but it's something that um, she did in the past with uh, this book. Um, we will explore other strategies authors have used to refer to gender fluid characters later, but this is one of the first uh, books and I do recommend you read it if you are interested. Um, it's a very good piece of storytelling. Um, another example where we can find gender fluid characters is in the work of Angela Carter that um, you may be fa already familiar with, um, specifically in her book, The Passion of New Eve. This is not one of the most famous uh, books by Angela Carter, but it's it's wonderful. I, again, I definitely recommend it. Um, very interesting, very relevant today as well. Um, strangely, strangely enough, uh, even if it, because it happens in a sort of dystopian future when she wrote it in 1977, uh, and many of her predictions kind of like became real as it happens in this very dystopian times we are living on. Um, and in this novel, um, you can see several gender fluid characters. So the first one is called Eve. Uh, starts uh, and this character starts as an English academic. He's a man who travels to a dystopian version of the US. Um, now, from there, the plot becomes extremely bizarre, but it's very entertaining. Um, so it turns out this main character ends up being kidnapped by an only women cult who forces him to undergo sex reassignment sur surgery. So our male character suddenly turns female, myth plot, which is. Um, and then has to explore all these ideas of gender because of course uh, their body has changed, but they are still you know, the man they were before or are they? And the novel sort of explores this. And there is a second character called Tristessa that the main character would encounter along his way, which kind of has a same journey, by, but in reverse. Um, it's a character that despite being born as a man, they use uh, female clothing and female makeup to sort of reenact the female gender because they are an actor. Um, other gender fluid characters in the book are mother. Mother is the sort of head of this only women cult um, that even though this is an only women cult, the description of mother sort of defies gender stereotypes because she has very manly, very manly attributes as well as um, the female attributes that are kind of like exaggerated. Um, as you can see in here, have an extract in which the character of mother is described. So mother is this um, cult leader who is also a plastic surgeon and has modified herself in various ways. Um, so as you can see the description here, her head with its handsome and austere mask teetering ponderously on the bull-like pillar of her neck was big and black and she wore a fo false beard of crisp black curls and she was breasted like a sow. She possessed two tiers of nipples, the result of a strenuous program of grafting, so that in theory, she could suckle four babies at one time. So as you can see, um, this character is extremely bizarre and has all these um, 
female and male attributes, almost like that uh, androgen that we were seeing in alchemy, that idea of when you reach this state of alignment, you have both male and female um, attributes. So Angela Carter, as a writer, um, she admitted that she didn't see much difference between men and women, and that she thought that the variation between people of the same sex uh, can be sometimes much greater, um, which is an idea that has also been explored in another example of critical work, epistemology of the closet, that you can also look at along with gender trouble that uh, we saw before. Uh, other kind of like gender fluid characters that you can find are in the novel, for example, Breakfast in Pluto in 1998, in which the main character is a transgender woman living in Catholic Ireland. Um, and you can see a quote here as well, in which Pussy, who is this main character, this transgender woman, she sort of fantasized with, uh, with the idea of being able uh, to give, to physically give birth to a baby um, and sort of like be surrounded with her family while having the new baby she has just delivered, which is obviously impossible for her. Um, so as you can see in this novel, there is the idea that uh, to completely own the female gender, she has to physically be able to give birth. She needs to physically be able to become a mother. Um, and it, this kind of shows how having truly fixed gender categories can be quite problematic for some characters. Um, so again, another interesting work you can um, actually look at. Um, right now, what's happening right now in literature, we saw some examples from the past, uh, but right now there is obviously more uh, gender fluid characters more than ever and more and more authors are exploring this. I wanted to give you the example of a contemporary Scottish author, Kirsty Logan, um, who um, in an interview said, I don't really think of my characters as male or female in general, Actually, a few of my characters are gender neutral. I just let the characters come to me. Sometimes a character's gender shifts as I'm writing them. So, and I included here a couple of books by Kirsty Logan. She mainly writes genre. So we have The Gracekeepers here, which was her first book, um, which is a dystopia that has some example of gender fluid characters. And then her latest book, Things We Say in the Dark, um, is a collection of short stories that also have uh, gender fluid characters. And this second one, Things We Say in the Dark, is more like in the horror genre. Um, and this is something, uh, it's a question I can ask I, I, I can ask of you, or maybe ask you to think about this now. Uh, if you write, if you create characters, how important is gender when you are creating your characters? Um, and if you, know, you think, if you have ever changed a gender in a character you had before or you wrote before. Uh, I certainly have um, as a writer for sure. Sometimes I have some characters that started as male and then I kind of changed to female and vice versa. Um, but it's a very interesting idea to think of in terms of creative process. Okay, so going back to our little creative exercise, I want you to um, look at the notes you took before when I gave you a couple of minutes to do it. And I want you to uh, change your character's gender. So maybe your character was female or male. So switch it to the other gender. And then maybe think about these three questions I have here. Do you need to alter what you wrote previously about them? Physical appearance, goals, fears. By changing this, character, this character's gender, um, are you seeing them now in a different way? Um, and maybe, Pre-write about this new character for I have here five minutes, but I think we are gonna cut it shorter. We are gonna give you again uh, another couple of minutes just to make sure there is enough time at the end for some questions. So I'll put my timer in here and do this exercise along with you. Um, yeah, so let's have just uh, three minutes to finish this. Okay, um, so if you can. Um, stop writing now and um, we will move on. Um, if you want to share any of your ideas after the lecture on these exercises, I'll be more than happy to listen to them as well. Okay, so after giving you a bit of a critical framework of around the idea of gender fluidity and also exploring some important works 
that have been written in literature with gender fluid characters. Let's move on to the actual strategies that you can use to write your own gender fluid characters. Um, so one of the easiest or the first strategies you may have thought of already if you were interested in writing gender fluid characters is to simply use your character's name uh, when you are referring to them uh, or gender neutral pronouns like you or we uh, that don't have any gender value attached to them and can be used to address uh, you know male characters, female characters, anything in between. So this is a strategy that is used by writer Maggie Nelson. So Maggie Nelson is a gender scholar, but she is also a writer, spe specifically a creative nonfiction writer. And one of her most celebrated works is called The Argonauts. So The Argonauts, again, it's very interesting. It does explore actually the idea of gender fluidity because it's all about, um, it's an autobiography. So it's all about her own life, Maggie Nelson's life. And it's about a specific period in her life in which uh, she got pregnant um, and her partner who identifies as a non-binary person was going through a mastectomy. So it's all about how their bodies were changing in that specific period of time. And it's sort of like a hybrid memoir because Maggie Nelson sort of explores a lot of really personal stuff around the idea of motherhood um, and the relationship she has with her partner, but it also offers ideas on precisely uh, gender and gender fluidity. So when she has to talk about her partner, um, who is called Harry, she either uses the name Harry or just says you or we to sort of uh, show how they are non-binary. So that could be a very easy strategy, but that's not kind of always possible, um, especially if you are writing using a third point of view, for example. So let's explore other strategies here. So sometimes characters, gender fluid characters, go back and forth the female and the masculine gender, and they can change pronouns accordingly. All right, so it may be that your character some, at some parts of the plot sort of presents themselves as a man, and then you can just use he, and then in another part of the plot, they present themselves as a woman, and then you can use she, and they can sort of like move back and forth. And this is perfectly possible, you know, obviously we have a very well-known example here, Orlando by Virginia Woolf has this kind of sort of character that moves between genders. Um, and a more contemporary example would be this other book, The Ballad of Lee Cotton by Christopher Wilson. The Ballad of Lee Cotton is a, it's actually a very interesting book. It's not very well known, uh, but in this book, the main character is uh, being born as a, as a boy, but at some point in the book, um, they, they have to change gender and then they become a woman and then they are addressed as she, uh, which, is, uh, which is quite interesting. So this change of pronouns is kind of like a form of shape shifting um, and it can show how again gender is performative as we were saying it's not something you are born with and stuck with for all your life but it's something that you can modify at will or your characters may be able to modify at will so it's a strategy that you can definitely use uh, but then let's explore a third strategy and this third strategy is to use gender fluid pronouns so actually there are gender fluid pronouns or like sort of like new pronouns, so not he and she, uh, that have been um, proposed as gender fluid. For example, the pronoun Z instead of using she or he. Um, um, and I will be showing later like a big list of these kind of new gender fluid pronouns. Um, you may want to use these because they are completely different uh, and they're already gender fluid. And definitely when you read Z, you know, uh, this is this is different. You know, you, you are immediately uh, aware uh, that this character is gender fluid. So this is something that the author Cameron Harley decided to do in her science fiction saga, The Mirror Empire. So um, I have a couple of quotes in here where you can see how she just uses these pronouns throughout the narrative, because in this science fiction world she has created, there are no less than five different genders. And so she has to use all these different pronouns to refer to them. 
So the issue with this strategy, you might think, is that um, sometimes using these non new non-binary pronouns can sound perhaps a bit artificial, or they may sound a bit too strange in the narrative. So it may be that if you are writing fantasy or, or sci-fi or a genre in which you have created a complete new world, then you feel it's quite easy to use these new pronouns because everything in the world is new. Uh, but maybe if you are writing a piece set uh, you know, in the past, or if you're writing a piece, a contemporary piece, and it's more like a literary fiction kind of thing, then maybe these pronouns are quite uh, yeah, different and you don't think they, they fit. So these are all things to consider. Um, but the advantages definitely of using these pronouns are that they clarify the narrative process uh, because using they, for example, which is quite a standard non-binary pronoun these days, um, using this in your novel when you, are, when you are writing can create some sort of confusion, um, especially you know, if you are dealing with different characters or if you are writing a scene that has quite a lot of action, then using they can be confusing. Um, so then using these new gender fluid pronouns may be an answer. So as I was saying before, uh, here you have all these different non-binary pronouns uh, that have been proposed and used uh, recently. Um, there are more actually, uh, but I just wanted to uh, give you a list. Um, as you can see here, they is there. I, I feel like it's the one that we all use today when we are um, when we want to refer to someone who is gender fluid or non-binary, but you have things like E, a pair, C, Z, V. Um, so lots of uh, different options or simply using the person's name as well. All right, so after we've seen these three different strategies, so either using just the character's name or pronouns that don't have gender attached to it, like you and we, um, shifting pronouns as a character shifts throughout the narrative, or using a non-binary pronoun like um, like they or any pronoun from this list here, I want you then to go back to the writing exercise we were doing um, and sort of, you know, look at your character, think what if they were gender fluid, you know, what if they were moving between these two genders, uh, which pronoun would you like to use with them, or what strategy feels better for you. Um, so perhaps look, have a look at this list or and then do some free writing trying to see what seems to work better with your character. All right, so I'm gonna give you another three minutes to do this while I also do it with you. So yeah, starting from now. Right. Um, so I hope that was helpful and or at least interesting trying all these new different pronouns. Um, and this is um, almost the end of the lecture. Um, if you want to do more research on gender, I have listed here a few resources, a few things you may want to look at. Um, there is the Gender Reveal podcast, which um, is really, really good and in a very enjoyable and fun way, sort of explores all the complexities around gender and can be very helpful to understand some definitions and things like that. Um, and then I have here a few other books you may want to um, look at as well with a more sort of like critical framework on the ideas on gender written by uh, gender scholars as well. Um, but, um, but yeah, this is uh, the end of the lecture. So I'm very happy to hear from you on the more creative exercises as well, or any other question you may have. So I will stop sharing my screen now, if that's all right. It's all right, Paula. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ines. That was brilliant. Really fascinating. Yeah. Thank on. you very much. Thank you. So I'm just going to look at um, the Q&A now and give people time to to write any comments. I hope that people were able to take part in the exercises. They were really interesting. 
Okay. Um, so Josiane says, thank you, Innes. How easy is it to be gender fluid when writing in Spanish? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Thank you, Josiane, for that, for that question. Um, well, it's, it's very difficult. It's even more difficult than in English. I think a very good thing in English is that, um, for example, you have a lot of, most of most words are not gendered really, like you have adjectives, for example, you have like happy, beautiful, these are adjectives, sad, angry, that you can use with either male or female characters or people and so on. Um, so yeah, it's pretty easy to just, um, to just English language as well. And then you have the pronoun they as well, which maybe because I'm used to listening to hear it all the time now, or I've used it with the students sometimes that uh, define themselves as non-binary, uh, but it sounds quite natural and I think it's quite useful. In Spanish, like in French, Josian, uh, many, many words are gendered, including adjectives. Mm -hmm. It's extremely, extremely difficult to, to do that, but it's possible. People are uh, proposing in, in Spain different ways of doing it. So, for example, changing the ending of adjectives. Uh, but I think it requires to change language a bit more, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> very good question. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much. Okay. Has anyone else got any comments or questions for Inez? Are people able to email you, Inez? Um, yes, for sure. And what about your own books? Obviously, you've mentioned that you've written five books. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the new book I'm working on now that um, is under review by publishers does have some gender fluid characters, which is why I started wondering mm -hmm. about this idea how to write my gender fluid characters. And it, it was quite difficult, um, specifically in my case. Um, I, one of the the book, a part of the book is, uh, is said in the 1930s, for example, like in the yes, past. Yes, yeah. Um, so when I was looking at it and I wanted to use like new pronouns like Z, I remember I tried using Z and Ni, which is not in the list, but it's basically N-E. Um, and I tried to use that to refer to them, but being said in the 1930s, it sounds yeah. strange. Like I think using all these different pronouns may be good in science fiction or- Yes, uh, yeah. Even now, to be honest, because I think now we are more used to it, but in the past, it just sounded jarring. So mm -hmm. uh, in the end, and then they was complicated because mm -hmm. if there is any writer in the audience, once you have, say, like a fight scene or a scene, yeah. lots of things can happen at the same time. If you write they, it gets confusing very easily. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, so what I decided to do in the end was just to shift pronouns, to use he sometimes, to use she sometimes, a bit like in Orlando, as I said, Junior Bulti uh, with her character and yeah so that was that was the way around it yeah eventually my yeah. solution but um there is not only one answer I think it's just plain and a language is to be changed and experimented on especially mm -hmm. if you're a writer so never be mm -hmm. afraid of even creating your own pronouns I don't know if that fits the story yes yes absolutely yeah. thank you um and Josiane says what would you say about Jeanette Winterson's book um, written on the written on the body as she has been criticised for that book. Is that the new Janet Winterson one? Because I haven't read it. <laughs> I haven't read it yet. It's the Frank Frankenstein one. Yeah. Um, no, it's an old one. The narrator has no name. She says. Mm, That's interesting. Oh, right. So I haven't no gender and um, no age specified. So I have, yeah, I haven't read that one sadly, but definitely I have to add it to my list. Um, like I know, for example, Ursula K. Le Guin, The Left Hand of Darkness I was talking about, that it's one of the earliest examples of gender fluid characters, has received a lot of criticism because she was using the male pronouns he and his to refer mm -hmm. to these gender fluid characters and a lot of feminists uh, back in the day and even now criticizing the book because of that kind of saying like well you can't claim that the he and his are like universal and blah 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 but i think you also have to judge a book you have to understand that the book was created at that specific time mm -hmm. so I, I, I guess in the case of ursula k Le Guin for sure 
it was the one it was one of the first books ever in 1969 which you know in america which was not <laughs> was pretty conservative i mean still mm -hmm. is today it was quite groundbreaking the fact that she was showing these characters that were gender fluid and she was trying her best and he said you know in re recent years um she was saying how she kind of regretted using the only the male pronoun and maybe she would have liked to use different ones or use they so maybe because just you were saying Janet Winterson, um, her book is also from quite a long time ago. I don't know. I think anything that sort of uh, questions gender mm -hmm. is always good, isn't it? Because it opens a conversation. So. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, thank you, Ines, for a really um, brilliant and fascinating talk. Um, and obviously, we'd be very uh, delighted to welcome you back um, for another lecture in, in the future. And we look forward to to hearing about your book launch um, <laughs> in the coming um, coming months so thank you very much everybody and thank you to laura from the events team in the in the background um, and thank you for attending so thank you very much Inez. thank you and thank josie Ann says thank you all thank you bye-bye bye thank you bye-bye